uh, basically define uh, you can define a uh, function in two ways uh, either as a zip package uh, basically a folder with uh, code and libraries or as a docker image and uh, one of the very important parts is that lambda can be invoked by various triggers what it means is that it's very integratable with other parts of your infrastructure. It could be various uh, things from uh, different queues or uh, API requests. And that's important because uh, you don't need Lambda by itself. You, you only need Lambda as part of your uh, whole infrastructure part. Now let's take a closer look at uh, how AWS Lambda works. So uh, basically the way it works is that you have to define code and libraries and uh, basically uh, or Docker image as Lambda configuration plus some parameters. And then uh, once you define it, if service has any incoming events uh, from the trigger, for example, new S3 file, API request, a uh, new message from a uh, queue. What it will do, it will take a function instance from function instance pool, put Lambda configuration within it, process the request and produce the response. This will be a call invocation because it will have to put, uh, initiate basically a uh, function instance. But after it's initiated, it will keep it for some time, uh, which may be up to 10 minutes, or it could be more. Uh, and in case new event will come in, it will process it faster. So there won't be initial initialization phase in this case. So now let's take a closer look at uh, uh, how um, the developing with AWS Lambda looks like, and more particularly, uh, how what are the usual uh, Lambda triggers? So usually it's just a way to invoke a Lambda function where you have input and potential output. There are a lot of ways how to do it. The most popular ways are either front-end gateway so that you can make API requests to AWS Lambda, file storage or any data storage, in general, it could be either S3 or DynamoDB. And S3 is AWS file storage, DynamoDB is AWS DB database. Or queue, which is could be simple queue service or SQS for short, or Kinesis. So now, actually, let's uh, try our first demo. So uh, basically what it will require, so we will be using my binder for running uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter Notebook will have all information uh, about uh, uh, basically uh, we'll have commands for deploying Lambda and running uh, some simple uh, workflow on it. So uh, before we uh, jump into the demo, let me just like make a quick uh, uh, Jupyter 101 because we will be using Jupyter for uh, deploying infrastructure and uh, making requests. So Jupyter Notebook, uh, to put it simply, is a way to uh, have mix of code and documentation where you can run each code cell and uh, that will execute code within it. So I will show you in, in the UI, but basically you just need to uh, click play button to run the cell and then wait for completion. And the uh, cell icon is very direct. So if it's empty, means that cell wasn't run before. If it has asterisk, means that cell is in progress and uh, you will need to wait for completion. And it, if it has some number within it, it means that cell completed. So uh, all notebooks are designed in a way that all cells are run 
uh, sequentially. And if you encounter any issues, please let us know either like uh, in the room or in Slack. Okay, so now let me jump and start the demo. Uh, so just to make sure, uh, do you have links to my binder? If not, let me share it in, in the Slack. Yeah, please share. Okay, I will share all three, but please uh, only run uh, first one first. <laughs> So it's uh, LBS tutorial channel. So it may take some time for it to start. And uh, just to make sure, uh, did you share AWS credentials or should I put them also in the channel? Yeah, please put. Mm -hmm. So I will share credentials, which you need to put in one of the cells. which I will show to you uh, here. And these credentials are the same for all demos uh, in Jupyter today. Okay, let me try to restart it and run it again. Um, meanwhile, actually, let me cover the code part while we are waiting for it to start. So the demo which we'll be doing, will uh, basically uh, create Lambda API gateway. Actually, it started. Okay, perfect. So basically, uh, as I mentioned, you just need to go through the cells. And for each cell, uh, it will return step finished when cell will finish. Can you increase the size of the font a bit? So it, uh, it's fairly readable inside. Uh, okay. Is it better now? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. So first we install necessary libraries. Okay, next we, you need to copy and paste here uh, the credentials which we shared and run the cell. Next you need to set up unique identifier, basically, 
put here your first name and last name. And next, we can actually deploy the Lambda. Uh, let's take a look at the code first. But uh, So basically, let's start the deployment. And while we're waiting for deployment, let's take a look at the code. So here, we're using Python for Lambda. And you can see uh, and what this code does. It takes the body of the request, appends it to hello, and just returns it. And you can see that code is very straightforward and very simple. You just have a handler with event and uh, body, which is part of the event. We, we take uh, body from it and we return it right away. So you have basically a web server in just two lines of code. So this simplicity is what makes uh, Lambda so appealing. And you, because you don't also don't need to handle any uh, scaling process. Also, we're using serverless framework for deploying our Lambda. It's a, a framework, open source framework, which is not connected to any cloud. So it works with uh, different clouds actually. And it is focused on deploying uh, function, function as a service services. And basically what it does, it, it creates all corresponding infrastructure pieces. For example, IAM roles and other parts. So now we're waiting for the deployment. Okay, now the, the deployment finished. Let's take a look at the result. Here you can see that it created endpoint for us. And now let's try to uh, call this endpoint, basically send post request to this endpoint with uh, the world with word world and see the results. So you can see it returned hello world. Basically just appended world to hello and that's it. But now we can actually also check the logs and verify that uh, Lambda run and that it received uh, the request. So you can see in logs, we will have like start log, meaning that Lambda started. We will have, have as you remember in our code, we had, we printed uh, event body, uh, request body. So we see basically the, uh, the word which we provided, basically here. And finally see the end duration. And because it's a cold start, we can actually see how much time did it take to start the Lambda and how much time it took to run the Lambda itself. If let's say we would run the same Lambda again, we, would, we wouldn't have this init time. So uh, let me check the comments. Yes, so my binder may take some time uh, to start. Um, but I think it looks like a good post to uh, uh, keep uh, to, for questions. So uh, let me know if you have any questions on uh, this first tutorial.
Um, sorry, I don't think I hear heard the question. No questions right no questions right now i think we're okay just maybe just maybe give people a minute to um catch up with you in the binder oh, okay well to provide uh more context you can see i mentioned serverless framework before but just so that uh, you can see, uh, the deployment process was very straightforward. I just needed to run serverless deploy, and it deployed the whole stack. And serverless also provides a way to get logs for a particular function and remove infrastructure if necessary. So basically, it provides does the whole thing for you. And because looks like we have time, and while we're waiting uh, for like for everyone, uh, let's also take a look at the. Uh, let me check if I have it nearby. I can show you how the config so serverless, like you uh, to use serverless framework, you need to define configuration file. And uh, here's an example how the configuration file looks like for this Lambda. So you can see it's very straightforward, just like what type of Python do we use, region, memory size, timeout, uh, handler, index.handler, which is basically name of Python file and function within Python file. And basically that we want to make an endpoint with hello path, and it should be a post endpoint. And that's it. So as you can see, uh, it's very minimal configuration file. I just okay. have one question about the configuration file. Uh, is there any standard uh, syntax for that? Like, I mean, which all options can be there, which is not possible, stuff like that? Um, it's an open source framework. So basically, it's it's not uh, an industry standard in a way that like it, it's more like a, a live project, which uh, has a lot of changes and it evolves with new AWS features. So uh, so okay. uh, mm -hmm. so it's not very standard <laughs> standardized. Yeah, in fact, uh, that that only raised uh, the question, like uh, because uh, sometimes like I was trying and some of the options it was not taking, but uh, some of the options it might take after some time. So I was just wondering if there was a good syntactical pointer to know okay these are the correct options to give versus these are not allowed anymore uh yes so it has a lot of options so for that you would need to check uh, its uh, documentation but uh, i would definitely recommend uh, serverless framework if you start if you just uh, exploring serverless world because it helps a lot with uh, deploying a lot of uh, infrastructure. Okay, thanks. Mm, yes. Uh, I was a little bit late, so I did not have any access to the Slack channel. Would you please send me um, the link for that? Uh, yeah, we'll do. So we'll thank zoom. you very much. Thank you.
First time, so there is a one issue. Security token included and the request is invalid at the step six before we like, get deploying the Lambda. This is connected to AWS credentials, I believe. Uh, no, it looks like uh, deployment failed. So I think it's best to either restart notebook. So hmm. yeah, I think it's best to restart notebook because maybe there was some problem with uh, uh, deployment. Uh, could we have maybe another icon if uh, like people were able to successfully complete uh, the the first demo? Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the first, hmm? okay. So in this tutorial, whatever is given after this dash D option is the body uh, for the request, right? Yeah, so this is okay. the body of the request. So okay. currently it's just one word, but it could be a JSON uh, encoded string or anything. Okay, uh, should we proceed to the next demo? Dmitry, what do you think? Yeah, I think we should. Okay, uh, let me go back to the slides. So, uh, so next I want to cover state in serverless. So Dmitry covered like why state is important and why serverless by definition doesn't handle uh, state like within it and it uh, has uh, ha like it has to get a state somewhere and there are two types of state which uh, serverless has to get it's persistent state and temporary state and it's best to describe it using uh, an example let's say we have lambda which does uh, machine learning predictions and for that we have model but we also have input image where on which we want to run the model and it would make a prediction that there is a cat on the image. In this case, model is a more persistent uh, state because we always load it within Lambda, but it's the same model every time for every event. And we have a temporary one, which is basically a cat Im new image, which we get uh, as part of the incoming request. And uh, this state can reside in different places. It could be part of cloud storage, for example, S3. Could be part of database, for example, DynamoDB. Or it could reside in intermediate connectors, for example, Q. Let's take a closer look at the different types of connectors. Uh, because basically, uh, like, an, how we can connect lambdas together and lambdas with another services. So first option, API requests, for example, REST API or gRPC, which is uh, next is message queues. And finally, orchestrators, which orchestrate, um, which manage state and call different services. So let's take a closer look at API requests. API requests are pretty straightforward. So we have a Lambda function, we have incoming request, Lambda function processes it and produces the response. Main features, uh, it works best with uh, synchronous tasks because we have to process uh, it within a some amount of time. For simple intermediate logic, because we are bounded by uh, our, by time we need to produce the response. And it can be parallelized by uh, API gateway, basically by how we make requests uh, to Lambda. 
and uh, we can use some throttling or auto scaling logic for handling peak loads. Next are message queues. And here it's also pretty straightforward. So we have Lambda function. We have queue with messages. And each message will be uh, basically start new Lambda. And Lambda will read these messages from the queue. And that is configurable. So Lambda may read one message or batch of messages. But basically, it will just read this message and uh, we'll proceed with it. So on the plus side, it can work with long running asynchronous tasks, although it will be limited by some time because uh, Q service uh, has to uh, receive uh, information about Lambda that it finished process, uh, processing the message. It may have retry logic upon a function's failure. So if Lambda failed to process some message, uh, it can basically start another Lambda to process it. It can be paralyzed by multiple consumers. So, for example, in Lambda case, it may like there will be like could be we could start like four lambdas and it will process this message, this message, this message, and this message. And finally, uh, to propagate state further, Lambda can uh, write uh, state in a different place. Uh, and uh, uh, next, let me. Uh, show the second demo. So basically here we will cover exactly this case where the function will read from the queue and will write messages to S3. And queue will have a dead letter queue configured for it, meaning that if Lambda will fail to process uh, the message, then it will be written to dead letter queue. So we could say it's a very basic uh, serverless pipeline. So now let's open uh, the second uh, notebook. Uh, I have a question. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, totally. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned that, okay, if uh, like you know that that Q example. If the function fails to read, uh, so is the failure you you know is it because the you know this node can fail to? You know, what could be the reason for failure? Is it the programmatic reason or the you know it is unable to run the lambda because of the infrastructure? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it could be both. So, uh, and in both cases. The, the message will be returned back to queue or to the dead letter queue. It could be a programmatic error. For example, um, code uh, encountered some internal error uh, on, on application code level. It could be an infrastructure issue. For example, Lambda doesn't have access to S3 because it was misconfigured. In this case, it will also fail to process the message. Um, I would say the only infrastructure issue which it won't handle if Lambda doesn't have uh, configured mapping to the queue, or there are some issues with mapping, then Lambda won't receive message in the first place. Okay, thanks. And then just related to that, like if, say, uh, while running the Lambda, it, I'm trying to understand the failure model, if it, the, the say, port fails or something, right? So would it actually retry the execution? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So it's configurable. So you can configure a number of retries before it will be sent to the letter queue. Uh, and basically, this type of mapping has a lot of different parameters. Retrying, um, like waiting, like after retry, and so on. OK, got it. Thank you. OK. Let's proceed with second demo.
basically here uh, the sequence is the same. We just need to pass to credentials and run uh, cells sequentially. Keep in mind that it may take a bit. Okay. Uh, it may take a bit longer to deploy it this time because it will need to create queues. Uh, just want to cover code as well here. So, uh, as always, only like ten lines of code. So basically. What we do is we parse event, and in case with SQS, it has, a, as you can see, event will look differently. It will have records field, and within the records field, it will have a body. Currently, we will emulate the error. So if uh, the message is not equal to value error, we'll just print a message body, message ID, and uh, we will uh, save. Uh, this file uh, as to S3 with message ID as key and with message body as uh, a file value. And in case we send message with uh, value error uh, body, we will raise value error. Basically, fail uh, the message. And one additional thing which you can see, in this case, it doesn't matter what we return uh, on handler. We just need to complete the handler successfully. But for SQS, it would mean that we successfully processed the message. But if we didn't reach the return, because we were, for example, here we will raise value error, then for AWS, it would mean that we didn't read uh, the message correctly and it will be retried or sent to the letter queue. So make it run in an infinite loop if we pass value because it will have time to try to execute this function and so it's value and then it is extended back to the queue. Um, sorry, what does it show? What does it say? What's there? So if we, uh, in, in the code, the value error is a parameter passed by us in the request, correct? Yes. Uh, basically, in, in our case, we will send two types of messages. We will send one message, which is not value error, and see how it works. And then okay. we'll send another one as value error. So basically, we're kind of emulating error scenario here. Right, so for the value error scenario, uh, it will go, it will raise the value error, right? And you said that it's gonna send this message back to the queue as it is not finished correctly. And uh, yes. the Lambda instance will again try to pick the same, uh, same message again from the queue, is it not? That's correct. Uh, depends on how you define. Okay. So you can define it with retry number one, and it will mean that it will only try it once, and if it fails, it will send it to the letter queue. You can define it that it will retry 10 times. So mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's very configurable. OK, so do we have that configured here in our instance? Uh, yes. So let me show you the configuration file. While we are waiting for the deployment. Uh, so here, so here you can see the example. So this is also serverless configuration. This is the read queue which we defined. We define the letter Q and we define max receive count. But so here it's one. So meaning after fail, it will 
redirected right away, but this number would be like 10, for example. Okay, got it. Next one. We deployed the queue. Now we can see both queues here. So it's read queue URL and the letter queue. Now let's start sending messages to the queues. First, let's send a normal hello world message. We can see the message ID, which was created. And now first we can check that uh, logs were successful for this function. So we can see that it processed the message. It has correct message body. And we can verify that it has correct message ID, basically the same as here. Next, we can actually check S3 because now we have message ID and we can verify that it actually created the file with uh, hello world. So we can basically download and check the file based on this message ID. Uh, okay. It has some issue, uh, but basically you can see that it uh, uh, showed hello world which is basically, the it showed the contents of the file, which it saved to S3. Now, let's actually send the value error message to the queue. And now let's see and, and, and check um, the logs this time. So as you can see, it started. So we, we see previous log, we see current log. So it started and it just raised value error. So it didn't complete and it failed. And now let's check and see that because we failed to process it, this message, it will be sent to that letter queue. Uh, okay, let's wait a bit because sometimes it takes time for it to appear. Uh -huh. Now you can see that this uh, message with value error is now in that letter queue. And there are different things we can do with it. So we can either use it for um, debugging or troubleshooting stuff, or you can connect uh, some another process to this data queue, which would do something with these messages. Okay, quick pause here. Um, was anyone able to run run it? Does anyone have any issues? Uh, and also, if you have any questions about uh, this demo, we'll be happy to answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a quick one. Uh, so in the step seven, when we added a message into the queue, can we run that with a two or two and you can see we have multiple entries in the queue? I, I, I tried and it's not showing multiple entries there. Then can you try? Uh, which step, sorry? Step number seven, when we are adding the message into the queue. 
Yeah, yeah, just mm -hmm. put let's say hello one, hello two, hello three. Yeah, so what it will do, it will make a new message and we can check the logs that it now should show uh, the new message here. Hello three with new message ID. And I think we can check that it created it on S3 site. But basically what it does, it finds this message ID from the logs. So yeah, uh, it currently takes the first one, the first message ID. So it shows hello world. But basically if we would check uh, this message ID on S3 site, we would see the new message body. Okay, uh, looks like demo completed for um, five people. Just wanted to check, does it take more time? Uh, did any issue happen? Okay, uh, while we're waiting, uh, let me actually show also how SQS looks like in the wild. So LBS also provides a web console. And that could be useful to basically see this, the queues which we created in the web and see the results and everything. So you can even send custom messages to the queue and see the whole parameters, uh, see statistics and everything. So that's a neat way to kind of monitor the performance. And you can even uh, see the messages themselves. So you can call for messages and find the message which was failed. So basically the same thing we got but just using Web Console.
Okay. Um, if there are any issues, please post comments to Slack. But I think it should be safe for us to continue. Okay, now let's go next. And finally, uh, the, there is a third type of uh, connectors called orchestrators. And orchestrators basically handle inputs, outputs, and they keep state within themselves and call different services. For example, in this case, it would first call lambda A, get the response, and then could use it to call lambda B. And it's best for working with asynchronous tasks. For example, it can handle tasks which run a very long time. It has information about workflow state within it. And because of it, like it can be very flexible when handling retries or errors, or uh, it can also parallelize tasks. Compared to SQS, for example, uh, orchestrator can have uh, a more customized logic for errors. And for different errors, it may have a different handling mechanism. For example, with SQS, all errors would go to dead letter Q. So to take a uh, closer look at AWS Step Functions, and AWS Step Functions is basically orchestrator implemented by AWS. Uh, it has graph-based workflows. And it acts basically as a glue between different LBS services and has support for a lot of them. Uh, has custom error handling, as I mentioned before. And one interesting thing it has is parallel dynamic execution, meaning that here, let's say we have a workflow and step start can generate arbitrary amount of tasks, let's say 20. And step task will process all these 20 tasks in parallel. And step reduce will uh, wait for all of them to complete and get, will gather the result. Uh, along with that, it will have logic for branching and uh, loops as well. So now let's take a look at the third uh, demo. Uh, basically, where we will have uh, AWS Lambda workflow with orchestrator with a step function, uh, which will, uh, where one lambda will generate task, and add uh, some number of tasks, then these tasks will be run in parallel, and then reduce will gather and assemble the results from the task step. So let's go to uh, for the third link. Okay, uh, so as always, uh, the, the process is the same. Please uh, run the steps sequentially. And do not forget to update the environmental variables. Yes, uh, that's a very important step.
Um, okay, that's not finished. Okay, let's take a look at the code and yeah, let's start the, the deployment process. So as you remember from the like uh, like from the diagram, we will have three lambdas here. But we will have uh, we will use a very neat life hack where we actually will all these three lambdas will have the same zip package. But they will have different handlers. So configuration wise, they will reuse the same package, but because they have different handlers, they will basically have different code, even though like their code is present in the same file. And here we can see like uh, how it will work. So one map Lambda will just generate tasks. In this case, three tasks with just task ID. Uh, the task Lambda will uh, create a result field, which is basically task ID plus one. And reduce Lambda will basically sum all results across all the tasks and print the result. And while we're waiting, let me also highlight how the uh, configuration file for the step functions will look like. So here you can see all three lambdas, which we have. So you can see that they just have different handlers. Next, we have a state machine, uh, which is basically a graph-based uh, notation language, where we, for each step, we define basically what type of task it is, what type of lambda it will use, and what is the next step. And that's it. So we define first step, we define Next step, which will basically parallelize tasks. And finally, we have a final task, which will get all the results. And we mark it as end true to uh, mark that uh, it will be the end of step function. Okay, let me check the deployment process. Okay, still going through. Um, So interesting part about step functions uh, is uh, basically, uh, as you can see here, you, it's, like, it, it's a bit more complex because now you need to define the whole execution graph and that makes it harder to debug. But at the same time, although in my example, uh, I was using Lambda, uh, you can, a lot of other AWS services could be like, uh, placed here instead of Lambda. Okay, now it's deployed. Let's see the logs. So it generated the service endpoint for starting step function. Let's actually invoke this step function. Okay, we can see that it started it and we can even see the execution ID. And now let's check the logs of each individual Lambda. So first it will be map Lambda. And here we expect to see all the tasks which we generated. We can see all three tasks as expected. Next we check Lambda task. And for Lambda task, we expect to see three parallel tasks. And you can see it here. So uh, they ha basically, they happened in parallel so much that it uh, they have mixed logs. But basically, uh, it's not the same lambda. It's basically three parallel lambdas, 
processing stuff. Ah, and we can verify it because as you can see, all of them are called starts. So all of these three lambdas have called starts because they all were started without any initial requests. And finally, we can check the reduced lambda to see the final results getting in one place. Yeah, so you can see here that we got all task IDs, results. We uh, basically uh, accumulated, uh, counted some of all results and got the final number. So okay, let me do a quick pause here. Uh, let me know if you have any issues with deployment or any questions about it. Okay, uh, since we have one additional minute, let me actually show you how the step functions look like in web console because it's also very, they have very neat visualization. So the advantage here is like one of the challenges we, in general, we're dealing with connectors is to troubleshoot stuff. And here, you along with lambdas, you can see actually uh, how the whole workflow worked. When something started, when it ended, but also for each step, you can see what was the input and what was the output. We saw it in the logs, but uh, basically we saw it, uh, it's very convenient when you can see it in a graphical way, like here. And in case some step would fail, we would also see uh, the failure, like, uh, or the error name or type here as well. Okay, um, so it looks like uh, there are no issues with demos. So let me finish the slides so that uh, we have time for break. So uh, let me just like go through the final slides and uh, go through the state of AWS Lambda today. So Going through different demos and seeing how it works, we can see that it has a lot of pros. It's very easy to deploy, connect to different types of connectors. It's very scalable and it's very convenient. But there are some cons. It's very hard to have like full local Lambda environment to make sure that basically you can reproduce what happens in the cloud locally. And there are no performance guarantees both in case how, my, how it will start lambdas, but also how it will handle cold starts. For example, uh, I mentioned that like if you have a new lambda, it will be warm for 10 minutes, but that's not guaranteed. And it may change depending on allocation of resources within AWS region. And there are a couple of limits which you have to keep in mind with lambda. It's execution type up, up to 15 minutes, it's memory RAM, disk, and concurrency. So uh, where it could be used? When you have simple compute because it only has CPU, if, it has, if you have to handle peak loads, then pretty good because it can scale pretty fast. Some periodic tasks, uh, basically it, it's uh, great at doing cron jobs. If you need to parallelize some simple task, it would be great as well. Or you need to do some prototype because it's very cheap. Where it's not, uh, it's not yet very efficient. So if you have latency critical workloads and you need to basically 
produce something, some response in two, three milliseconds. If you have to process a lot of data, like uh, 50 gigabytes of data and so on, then Lambda wouldn't be an option because it has a 15 gigabyte limit of memory. If you have some computer intensive workload or high load serving, then uh, Lambda wouldn't work in this case as well. So main takeaways, which I want uh, you to take from this talk is that uh, Lambda is leading uh, the serverless cloud and it's very easy to start working with it. Um, you can see that it's very flexible and you can do a lot of different stuff with it, with uh, dynamic invocations and different orchestration. But uh, with a lot of stuff, you still need to understand, uh, like you need to test it and benchmark it to understand whether it works in your case. So uh, I would definitely uh, promote uh, joining the Vihive initiative and using it to benchmark and understand whether Lambda will work in a particular case or not. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll be happy to ask any, uh, answer any questions if we have time, but feel free to send me any emails or connect with me about my, web my website if you have any questions about it. And I have some open source GitHub repos, so feel free to check them out as well. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much for your tutorial, uh, especially uh, he's uh, halfway around the globe. And I think it's two in the morning or so where you are. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you very much for still uh, coming to the tutorial and helping us uh, and guiding us uh, through this. Amazon. It was very interesting. Thank you.